Hello everyone and welcome back to The Geek Wave. This is the low budget show. It's the show so low. It has no budget. And guess what, folks? We are on our 100th episode of The Geek Wave. So for 100 episodes, I've talked about geeky bullshit. I've made it this far in my life. And we're going to continue to go further down. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Content forever, as they say. The train never stops. As long as I'll be doing this, I will be here to make people happy. Am I making people happy? I don't know. But 100 episodes, that's pretty cool. It makes me very... I'm proud of that, you know? Even if these aren't the best numbers out of everything I do, I think it's a necessary content to be like, hey, you can extend a formula that you've worked on before to a larger medium, and maybe people will be more interested. So I think that's very cool. I hope it satisfies people's interest in everything I do here. It's very fun. So 100 episodes, here's to 100 more, and maybe at 100 we will... Uh, I don't know, maybe if we make it to a thousand, which seems like an impossible task because, man, is it hard to do things. <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens. But cool. Content forever, as they say, folks. Long live the train. Long live the train of content. Chugging along down that road, content will never stop. It's great. And we are back. Not our first episode of 2022, but our first episode. Actually, I should say 2023, not 2022. 2023, the year of what's the zodiac or the Chinese year? This. So let's see if we can look it up. What is this year's animal sign? Let's see what the, we are. Year of the rabbit, folks. It's the year of the rabbit. What does that mean? I don't know. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's good. And I'm looking it up now. Wikipedia says eminent personalities in the year of the rabbit are Lionel Messi, Brad Pitt, Johnny Depp, and Angelina Jolie. What does that mean exactly for us? Who's to say? Probably nothing good. Because, you know, maybe some of those people aren't the best. One in particular. Maybe two. Well, is, do we like Messi? Is he the one we like now? I don't watch. I don't watch football, so I don't know. But yeah, let's talk about some news that just came out at the beginning of this year, leading us into what's going to be happening in 2023. A couple of trailers, a couple of reboots, a couple more cancellations we need to talk about, and a couple of renewals. Very fun. So first off, let's talk about this because it genuinely piqued my interest. So Ridley Scott had a very interesting past couple of years. He did a back-to-back -back House of Gucci and The Last Duel. I believe the Napoleon movie he made after both of those is also coming out this year. Doing all of those, the dude still building up momentum. He's like, it's time for Gladiator 2. So Gladiator 2 is announced. He's working on casting. And as of last week, casting for the lead in Gladiator 2 goes to Paul Mescal. And Paul Mescal coming off of After Sun, which I still have yet to see. I I'm so looking forward to that movie. I'm just trying to find like the right time I can go out and watch it. I'm super pumped for it. Very good get. He feels like the kind of actor that's easily going to be scooped up by a bigger property or bigger person. So this works well. He will be playing Luke, Lucea, Luke, Lucea, the son of Russell Crowe's character. It's said a couple years after the events of Gladiator. Personally, I have no real like attachment to the Gladiator mythos, but I think it's very cool that we're actually going back and it's like, yeah, Ridley Scott wants to tell more stories in that universe. It was obviously a big movie for him and something he was passionate about. Now, here's what I'm hoping. Here's what I'm really hoping for. We kind of like return to the era of like, look at these big science fiction properties. Look at the musical coming back. Maybe it's not doing financially good, but we're getting back to like mid budget and that kind of stuff. Wouldn't it be very cool if like Gladiator 2 got us back to like really good swords and sandals films, you know, where it's like we're finally back to that era where everyone is attempting these and trying to make them and they're cool again and they're profitable again. You know, not like The Northman, which is such a really good movie and I, I adore that film, but just like, hey, we're doing Gladiators, we're doing Big Ben-Hur's or Troy's and all that kind of stuff. I love that era. I feel like that's also like a forgotten part of like popular culture. Ridley Scott's great, Paul Mescal, part of it. Could be really impressive. I, I hope that's the case and that becomes something special. And speaking of special, we have got a new trailer for an April release of Evil Dead Rise. So Evil Dead Rise is essentially a reboot of the Evil Dead universe. 
which I, I guess makes sense. Now, I'm a huge fan of Raimi's movies, everything adjacent to that universe, because that's the kind of stuff I liked. It's kind of like slapstick, cartoony humor of how far can we go just making Bruce Campbell act against himself and act like the most insane person alive. I love all of that. But I understand how in contemporary times, that either is too far gone, we've done too much of Bruce Campbell in this universe, and maybe going back to basics is what this franchise needs, which I'm okay with. So we got a trailer, it looks like there's going to be a family staying at the cabin, and everything's going to ensue with a more modern lens and a more modern family, which I think is kind of a fun idea. It makes a lot of sense. I think we're going to be getting a lot of good cabin stuff, because we got Knock at the Cabin coming out next month, which is going to be really cool. I was impressed with the trailer. I think we'll I think we'll come back and talk some Evil Dead before that releases or around it. Very fun franchise. Going back to like the iconic horror roots makes a lot of sense. It's like what if Raimi was given the budget? I know he's only producing this movie. It'd be like what if Raimi was given the budget he got in like the original movie and he stayed true to like the horror narrative as opposed to doing like a Stooges cartoon? That's pretty fun. I, I think that's going to be really cool, make for some very interesting content. I like The Evil Dead a lot. I know some people are very mixed on that franchise, but I've been a fan of Bruce Campbell. He's a great leading man. Sam Raimi is a great director, and everything about that just looks like it's going to be cool. So I am impressed with that world, and I cannot wait to see what comes from it. And aside from that, we do actually have another trailer to talk about which is for a big mid-budget movie. They're back, everybody. After the success of Megan, we are finally back to mid-budget movies, especially from Universal, who's just been crushing it lately, in my opinion. Universal's like, you guys like Dracula? What about a Renfield movie? And as much as I think the trailer was boring and not interesting, I'm just glad this exists. So the basic premise is kind of like, what if Renfield was in like a hashtag toxic relationship and his like boss was this really creepy guy. And I'm like, that I guess is something personally, I don't like the idea of doing that narrative in 2023. Doesn't sound very compelling or fun. I know why it's happening. I know why they're doing it. The trailer just had a lot of like, Oh, that's your boss. Oi, that's a weird guy. Hashtag that just happened kind of energy. And that is not a really fun energy that I like to play with. It just didn't come across as like naturalistic or compelling. But Nicholas Holt getting a chance to lead another big thing. Hey, I'm always on board for that. I think the guy's a great actor. I think the menu proved that he's willing to come back and take some opportunities in this. He was like the mid 2010s guy. So yeah, come on back. Come on down, Nicholas. Let's see what you got. Aquafina's doing her usual thing. The jokes are doing their usual thing. Nicolas Cage is doing okay. Not a lot we saw of him in there, but I, I get what they're going for. And I have no issues with that. It's all fine. It's all whatever, you know? It looks like it's going to be a solid film. A nice April release, which will coincide with the month of horror that's going to be April for some reason, because we also have Evil Dead Rise coming out that week. Very cool. I like that a lot. That's going to be really fun. But aside from those, there was a piece of news that surprised me to my core that has been reported across time and time again. Michael Giacchino, who did the amazing Werewolf by Night special presentation for Marvel Studios, well, he got the itch. This director just got the itch, which is kind of really cool to see. And if you saw Werewolf by Night, you're like, oh, this is classic horror like, it's taking inspiration from icons of the genre, with great music cues of the genre, with great movie techniques of the genre. What would this guy do next? What is Giacchino going to do next? Well, it turns out he is going to be working on an adaptation, a retelling of Them. And if anybody has not seen Them, this movie is awesome. So Them, if you are unfamiliar, is just big ants, man. Big ants come and attack people. It is so cool. And I'm like, that makes perfect sense because it's right around that time of things like Creature from the Black Lagoon, which were obviously big inspirations for his movie, Werewolf by Night. It's just so cool. Like, I, I when I put up the picture on the YouTube for you guys to see, you're going to be like, oh my God, we're going to see big ants. 
people fighting them. And I'm like, that's so cool. Like, that's the that's the stuff where I'm like, I do not need to see another whatever movie you're rebooting from, like, the 2000s or from the 90s or the 80s. Like, cool. Creed 3, that's awesome. Somebody announces they're going to be doing a them reboot. I'm like, that's exciting. Give me a blob movie. Give me all those classic icons being restored. Not even classic icons. Give me all those characters being restored. Who doesn't love a good monster flick? It's awesome. That is going to be so cool. I'm so pumped for that. Almost more than anything else I've heard announced in a long time. I am excited for that. It just sounds so cool and fun. I love the idea of it. I love it. We're going to be talking them. Don't you don't you worry, darling. We're going to be talking them at some point because it is straight up my type of movie. Big stupid ant puppets. I love it. I love that shit. Imagine imagine if like we gave I okay, I got to save this for another video. It's such a cool idea. What if we did like forbidden planet but like in the style of dune where we gave that property like a big proper send-off oh man i would be ecstatic that's such a cool idea we're gonna save that come back to that next week nah maybe not we'll see what do i have planned for next week i can't even remember but awesome stuff and that's not all there's some more news i do want to talk about there was kind of some reports going around that maybe the show wednesday from netflix was going to be moving to Amazon because MGM purchased the rights, blah, blah, blah. You get it, Amazon purchased MGM, I should say. Whatever. Uh, no, it's going to be staying at Netflix. It did get renewed for a second season, which is not really the news I want to talk about because I'm like, yeah, Wednesday, the most successful show of all time just because it's a, it's a rip on like the CW who gives a shit, whatever. I think that's really interesting. That kind of goes like this other news I was just kind of like hearing people talk about where it's like someone asked Sarah Michelle Geller, like, do you want to do another like Buffy show or you want to see like a reboot? And she's like, why? Everything is Buffy now. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Everything is Buffy now. And this Wednesday show is Buffy. And, and because everything is aping on that, it doesn't feel like it's good or fun anymore. I do not like the Wednesday show. I've done a review of it. I've talked about it. Not a show I enjoy or think feels authentic to the character or has any staying power, but I completely understand how the TikTok generation, which is the number one consumer on Netflix, I'm guessing, is keeping up to date with that. Now, I say this, and I think it's like, cool, Netflix actually renewed some content. I was having a conversation the other day with my sister, who, for the first time, I think, since we, since she got Netflix has decided it's time to cancel it because there's nothing on there she wants to watch. And I'm like, that is completely fair. I completely understand the necessity for you that because I do this for a living, hey, it's a living, right? I have to keep Netflix, but I, I'm actively not watching anything on there between Copenhagen Cowboy boring me and Wednesday being like, whatever. I'm only really staying on here now for like the Sandman because that sounds interesting. I do want to see Rebel Moon, surprisingly. But I'm not like jumping for joy every time Netflix announces something. So I'm hesitant on the company. Their prices have gone way up. They're canceling like account sharing where if you have your account active on more than one household, they're like, fuck you, get fucked, you're a piece of shit, buy your own fucking Netflix. It's bad. And on top of that, this news isn't just about Netflix, but I do want to bring it up in particular to Netflix because they have just announced that they are canceling inside job. Which, again, a show I didn't particularly love. I haven't watched the second season. And now I'm just like, do I even want to? What are we doing here? This leads into a larger conversation. I do want to talk about a little bit about, like, the use of animation in, like, this format. We just had Wendell and Wilde do really well. Pinocchio do really well. And, you know, Spider-Verse looks great. And Turning Red was amazing. And Strange World underperformed. It's like this weird spot for animation between Netflix, like, Inside Job isn't working, and AMC Plus, like, well, Pantheon, we filmed season two, but we're going to cancel the show and remove it from the platform. We're back in the world of animation doesn't get the love it deserves. And I think that is just, like, these networks don't understand what they have and the audiences that are going to build over time when you let a show grow. It is the number one problem with streaming is that because there's no immediate response, nothing grows. You think I'm genuinely surprised that we have things like Abbott Elementary that have been slowly growing its audience, given the chance to grow. It's like, oh, there was no immediate response. 
we canceled it. Maybe that's the thing that we're seeing on network television where it's like, oh, this Quantum Leap show is doing decent enough numbers for the amount of money we're putting into it. So now we can come back and do another season, let the audience grow. If it doesn't grow, maybe for the third season, then we're going to stop because we can't keep putting this in here. With things like Netflix and AMC Plus and all of these companies, all of these streaming companies, the thing is like, if nobody, if it doesn't break like the top 10 streaming numbers, like the day it comes out, they're like, nobody's watching this. Like, you have to let things grow. They were slowly trying to do weekly releases for some of this stuff now. And I'm like, can we just stop, please? Let these things grow. I think Netflix is going to shoot its own foot and kill itself eventually. I, I really do think that. These types of choices, especially something like inside job where they don't really have that feeling on Netflix anymore of that show allowing itself to grow. Aside from Big Mouth, what other animated property on Netflix has been given the chance to grow? And I think Big Mouth is only going strong because Nick Kroll's father is a very, 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 very rich man. And it's probably like, hey, daddy, I need some help keeping my project afloat while I do my silly cartoon stuff. And you're a billionaire. Can you just help me out here? And they're like, yeah, sure, son. Boom. It's humiliating and embarrassing and it sucks. But hey, Wednesday season two, right? The only confirmed thing right now, and after that, it's going to be canceled. Because here's the here's the thing, right? Sandman, another show I'm actively wanting to watch on Netflix. They're going to get the second season. Zaslav was already like, how the fuck do we let this get renewed on Netflix? It should be on HBO. What are we doing here? So that, on top of the Amazon MGM stuff, both of those shows are probably going to get one more season and then get kicked off to whatever the hell. Maybe they'll move to HBO Max or to Amazon, but it's dead. Everything's dead. The world sucks. Netflix ruined television for an entire generation. Kids, you do not understand the importance of filler episodes, of weekly releases, and allowing characters to grow or not grow in these slow moments. Binge culture ruins television. That's all I got to say about this. Go watch Inside Job. Maybe we could get that show to stay, but I don't know. All of this sucks. The world's falling apart. So let's talk about more entertainment after we take a quick break. Okie dokie, folks. I had this really bright idea the other day after seeing James Gunn just be like, hey, guess what, everyone? We're doing DC. Remember DC? We have an eight to 10 year plan. We did it, I guess, in the span. Because when did he get announced for the company? Was it like October area? So I guess in the span of like, let's say six months, the dude's like, here's what we're doing for 10 years. They're not going to announce it all this month. He has said that we'll be getting some of it this month. If I had to guess, maybe the first two years are going to be revealed. I would say maybe like three movies or like here's a TV show. Here's a couple movies. Here's the Superman movie we're working on. Here's the TV show I've been writing. That kind of thing. But because it's the 100th episode of The Geek Wave, I was like, hey, I'm no better than James Gunn, and James Gunn is no better than me. If I was in his position, what would I do for 10 years of DC movies? So I made a timeline of 10 years of DC movies. And I know what you're thinking. You must have poured your heart and soul into this to make it special. You have an entire like timeline planned out perfectly, and it's beautiful, and it's storytelling, and you're a genius. And here's the thing, folks. This was hard. <laughs> I mean, we all have our like ideas for what we would do in this situation, right? Like half of us are like, yeah, of course. Like I know I'd, I'd start here. We'd end up doing this and like that year. The thing was, I didn't realize how much I don't want to do like big movies, <laughs> you know? And maybe it's because I was burned out on like so many of them back to back where it's like, oh, a multiverse movie and infinite Spider-Man and an end game. I was like, let's do the opposite of that. So here I have my timeline. I tried to do it in like the classic like phase scale that Marvel did where they like, here's like a line showing you the phase we're in, the movies and the TV shows coming out. I didn't give specific dates because I'm not a fucking loser. I don't know. I, 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 don't, I have other things I could do with my time. Not watch After Sun though. I can do other stuff. But the idea was like, okay, we have that. 
I broke it up into five separate things. So like years one to two, three to four, five to six, seven to eight, and eight to nine. And no, nine to 10. What did I say? Whatever. Whatever. You, you get it. You, you, you guys know what I mean. <laughs> I, I, yeah. 10 years, five stuff there. It's all available for you to see. And if not, I'll break down the phases in each time code if you want to skip to a certain year that I'll be talking about. And you can see that going on. So it's all good. Now, here, here's the stipulations I made for myself. One, I don't want to do an infinite amount of movies each year. So I capped off as like, the first few years, I cannot do more than three movies. The max I'm willing to do is three movies a year, but that could include more TV shows than that. I also want to keep it very steady. I didn't want to oversaturate the market by doing all this stuff. I also kind of wanted to make it cohesive and have an actual like flow to it where it's like, oh yeah, these were the characters we'd have to hit and all that noise. So there's specific breaks that when we get to them, I will bring up like what I would do in that situation. And then I was thinking like, okay, DC has a complicated history that starts in like the 30s to 40s to 50s to 60s to 70s. And then shit hits the fan. So my idea is like, I didn't cast anybody. I didn't give you like specific villains or characters. There's some that I will talk about kind of, but the idea is very simple and very simplistic that like this could all be leading to something else. When we say maybe this is like the third installment of a movie, it could be like, oh, maybe this is where we shift over and do something new. There's a huge sliding time scale of DC in particular because all of these characters have had multiple like sidekicks and replacements. That's a hard concept to get into, but we're going to try. So keep in mind, I don't have an age picked out for any of the actors. Any moment we could do it. Because we are a sliding time scale, again, who gives a shit? My basic idea is that we can recast whenever we want because DC is all about rebranding. So if it doesn't make sense, who gives a flying hoot, right? None of it matters. So let's get in to the first two years of my DC cinematic universe. Starting with year one, which is consistent of three movies. The first movie of which is, of course, the linchpin to an entire cinematic universe, the most important character you have to create in order to make your cinematic universe. I am, of course, talking about Superman. You cannot start this without Superman. The first one you do has to be Superman. He is the key to everything. If you're going to do this, it got to be Superman. You introduce all of his key characters in there. Lois, Jimmy, Perry, the Kents. You obviously could put Lex in there, get other smaller villains in there if you want. Just establish the universe exists because Superman exists. It has to start with him. It doesn't end with him, maybe, but it just starts with him. And then we build up to other stuff. Obviously, Superman is the number one. Now, my second movie in our first year is none other than a group of heroes that were represented in a movie very recently. Were they represented perfectly? I would say no, but I wanted to establish a type of timeline. So my second movie is The Justice Society of America. Now, the reason I wanted to do the JSA so early is because first when we introduce Superman, you're like, okay, the modern times, that's the character. The thing about the DC universe is that it needs to feel like heroes have always existed for this to make any sense. So, sliding time scale wise let's have a movie of the JSA set kind of like in the first Captain America era. We could say World War II, World War I. I'm going to loosely say it's in like a golden age of a different type of story. You have young versions of those characters appearing because, boom, guess what? It's magic. None of this matters. They can age up and we can have older actors playing them in the present, which we'll get to in our second year. No specific members of the JSA to talk about, just that like, hey, they're there. What are they doing? Who knows? Who's to say any of that? It's all great. Very fun stuff. So that's what we established. Metropolis, we've already established in our first year. A history of superheroes we have established in our first year. We're also going to establish the world of the magic characters in our first year with a Zatanna flick. Zatanna, a character who could easily lead a franchise on her own. She is the perfect gateway introduction to a magic universe. Something I have always said about DC as opposed to Marvel is they get magic right. 
Marvel knows how to do magic, but it's all just a bunch of like hoo-ha here, say whatever. DC magic is like Marvel Cosmic, where there's such a finite detail to it that it works perfectly. So when we have Zatanna, you're introduced to a larger world. We can introduce you to maybe Kent Nelson, somebody that maybe knew her father when her father was associated with the JSA, perhaps. Have that work out. Have that connection be established right there. We also get a bunch new characters we can play with. Now, just simple teases. Maybe a blue devil appears. Maybe a Entrigan appears. Maybe we see a dead man appear. The idea is we are slowly building that up. That is everything I have in year one. When we go to year two, we have three movies and one TV show, starting with our Batman movie. Again, when we're doing another year, you have to start with the other linchpin of your universe, which of course is Batman. It's exactly the same setup as a Superman film. We're introduced to Metrop, we're introduced to Gotham, I should say. We get Bruce Wayne, all of the associated characters that come with Bruce Wayne, some of the Bat family. Now, here's the thing where it's sliding time scales. We're starting off with he has a Robin. This is the introduction to Dick Grayson. Now, maybe it's halfway through the movie. The events could be like, hey, we see what happens to the Flying Graysons as a plot point in this movie, which leads to him getting his Robin. That is what I want to see happen in this first Batman movie. Very important. Establish some of the characters, lead to bigger ones. All makes sense. That is our first movie in our second year. And our second movie in this year is is, of course, the third in our trinity. It is Wonder Woman. Now, you could do this one of two ways. You could have Wonder Woman be connected to the JSA originally, which I think would be a really fun idea. I would have her be like, she is the ageless wonder from that time where she has an age since meeting those characters. So she was aware of them when she first came to Man's World. Now it's the present day. She is in a new world of heroes, having to fend for herself in a new light. That is what we are seeing Wonder Woman do. This is where you introduce Minerva and Dr. Psycho and Giganta. You could have Steve Trevor show up. I like the idea of a modern Steve Trevor than just having him stay in like the World War I era. So that's what I would do there. That is where I would put Wonder Woman. That is where she's going to be right now. And we get our first television show, which I wanted a show that I could have run cohesively throughout the entirety of this narrative. I wanted one TV show that exists solely as a TV property. The character can, of course, appear wherever she needs to because she matters. Black Canary was my star of television. I'm a huge Dinah Lance fan. Very fun character. You can establish some new characters appearing in that. Maybe in our Justice Society movie, there was an older Black Canary that we could make her mother or her grandmother. We can introduce Ted Grant Wildcat into this movie or into the show, have him be connected there, set up the large universe, just our street-level character. My Essentially, my goal with Black Canary, and again, I don't want to do parallels to the Marvel stuff, my goal with Black Canary is I want her to kind of be our daredevil. Just the character that whenever she shows up, we're like, oh, that's awesome, I love Black Canary. We can put her in any iconic costume we want. She can interact with any character and have it make sense. She's a fun character we love to see, and she can hold her own on television. That is what I want from Dinah. That is what we're going to do there. That is why she is our first TV show. And coming from that, we go to our third and final feature in our second year, which is The Flash. And because The Flash is a really hot property right now, I want to change it up dramatically, dramatically <laughs> from everything we have seen in whatever the, Flash, the current Flash movie is doing. So this Flash is low stakes. Now, my plan of The Flash would be like, okay, well, actually, we'll get to my plans of The Flash as we progress into everything else going on. Just keep in mind, probably the rogues gallery is the villains for this one. Captain Cold, Heat Wave, Mirror Master, Trickster, Weather Wizard, all those low-level guys. Have them team up to fight the Flash in the first movie. It works fine. That is the first two years. Six movies, one television show. And after that, we move to year three and year four, where things are starting to pick up slightly, just ever so slightly. So, when it comes to year three... I want to lean into another type of story. When we introduce Zatanna, we're doing magic. 
So let's go a little bit more cosmic and we'll do a Green Lantern movie. This could be the introduction of Hal Jordan if you wanted to. Not necessary in my opinion. When it comes to the Green Lantern, there is a huge mythos for us to play with. Let's say this is the introduction of John Stewart to the larger universe. I want Hal, John, and Guy all to be represented in the first movie. Our point of view character should be John. Hal, of course, is my favorite. I don't know how you would mix that up or do that. All I know is when we're doing Cosmic, it's got to be Green Lantern as the introduction. That is where I want to start. So that is my first movie of year three. My second movie of year three is the sequel to Superman. Now, when we just established Metropolis in our first year, we have all these fun characters. The idea I wanted to explore for the sequel is Superman versus the Elite. We have Superman here. The world's already questioning him because that's what we needed to do, especially when we're rebooting Superman in the actual, like, real life. Characters are going to be like, or real people, I should say, are going to be like, what do we do? What, like, it's Superman. Like, what are we doing with this? That is why if we do Superman and the Elite, you can do that kind of story where we are introduced to other characters for him to fight. We can have Manchester Black become a supporting character in this world. He shows up. Everything is hunky-dory. Very fun. Very cool. All that stuff. And people are like, oh, that's what Superman means. That is what we're supposed to be doing. Oh, I get it. That works fine. And in the third year, we are introduced to our second television show, which is spinning out of the pages of Zatanna and will lead into another movie in year four. We're getting Hellblazer. Now, John Constantine has been given a lot of chances and a lot of stuff. I think he works well in this format. I know people are like, we need Keanu Reeves' Constantine back, but I want to do a straight up Hellblazer you know, like show. Where it's just like the Vertigo comic, the old hardcore stuff. The thing about DC is it feels like a world that is willing to let itself go a little more dramatic, go a little more intense. So I think Hellblazer, a good just like, hey, we're taking more chances than Marvel did. We're doing something very intense, very disturbing, very weird. So that's what I want to see as the third piece in my third year. So that TV show, take a little bit of a break. Maybe maybe Hellblazer comes out in the summertime, same as Superman 2. Then we jump over to year four, and we start introducing Dick Grayson to a larger world when we do Teen Titans. Our first movie in year four is Teen Titans. Now, Dick Grayson is a character we just introduced a couple years earlier. This is him as Robin for a little bit, out on his own for the first time, where he meets characters like Starfire, Raven, Beast Boy, and Cyborg, just characters he can become friends with. If you wanted to, again, I don't know if we need to do this right now because we haven't really introduced a larger world, maybe Wonder Girl. If we wanted to put Donna Troy on this team, we could. If we wanted to put other characters, I think that's for like a later discussion to lead them up to, maybe as a separate thing, because there's other sidekicks we haven't introduced yet because we haven't introduced those characters. And that's really fun. Teen Titans story, introducing the world to Dick Grayson as this leader type. He starts getting ideas in his head as to what he should be, how he should behave. Dick Grayson instantly becoming a linchpin for every couple of years of this world, which we will get into. Now, because this is a young actor, we're going to do back-to-back -back filming, which we'll get back to when we talk about another year. But right after Teen Titans, we have Aquaman. This Aquaman, a huge introduction to an entire world. We have Atlantis, we have Mera and her people. Black Manta shows up. I also want to make Garth the main character. So now that we have Garth introduced in this movie, if we were to do another Teen Titans, Garth could appear that way, become Tempest or Aqualad, whatever you wanted to do there. Just introduce us to a larger world in a way we haven't really experienced it yet. You know, we're doing cosmic and magic. It's just more like low level stakes and those things. But Aquaman, we're getting a bigger universe, a bigger world. Very fun to explore. And then we have another season of Black Canary. It's like what I said. My show that is going to carry through on every single, well, not every year, a lot of years. I want a bunch of Black Canary stuff happening. I want her to be like, hey, when is she going to make the big break to television or break off of television into the movies? We're all waiting for that. When is it going to happen? And my final film of year four is a sequel to Zatanna. Now, this could be a, just like a bigger team up. This could be a more expansive universe. Maybe she is dealing with a threat that leads more into what we're going to see in the next couple of years. 
Maybe this Zatanna 2 teases us a larger crisis, a larger threat in more universes. And it's a good way to wrap out year four where people are suddenly starting to see the picture like, oh, maybe we're leading to something. Because then we go to years five and six and a clearer picture is starting to come through. So my main goal for year five was I want to expand on one, comedies. I want to do more comedies. And two, the Batman mythos. We've done a lot of Dick Grayson. So when he's coming off of year four, all about the Teen Titans, in year five, we're going to get a movie, which is a sequel to Batman, which is called Batman and Robin. And this is going to be the movie where Dick Grayson stops being Robin. We're doing a little early in the career, but again, we were introduced to him in the first Batman movie. We see him as the Teen Titans learning to experience himself. This entire Batman movie is about his arc stepping away from the role of Robin, learning he can grow up and evolve from being this person. A strong Batman movie, maybe he he realizes the hypocrisy of Batman, steps away from that role. That is the first thing we want to do in year five, is establish the broken relationship between Bruce and Dick. I want that to become prominent, something that is featured, which will appear in other movies in the same year, sort of. And as that's going on, we then move to a comedy movie, which is not something we've seen a lot of so far. Again, we've done horror, we've done cosmic, we've done television. We haven't really done comedy. So we're going to be doing Blue and Gold. We're going to be introducing Blue Beetle, Ted Cord, and we're going to be introducing Booster Gold. Two characters that I love and are fun. This is, again, kind of spitting out of the Zatanna thing where it's like, okay, magic is introducing us to multiverses. We have two guys going on a time travel adventure, doing some weird shenanigans, going through time, trying to make money while doing it. Just these awkward dudes who are suddenly these powerful heroes who are running away from the Time Lords and Rip Hunter and all that stuff. So that introduces us to a larger bubble we can play with and other stuff and do something cool with fun movie. Now, if I was James Gunn, if I was the James Gunn of the situation, and because we know James Gunn is writing Superman, the movie, and another TV show, Blue and Gold's the movie I want to write. Five years in, I'm like, okay, I've produced all of these. Let me write Blue and Gold and make a silly movie. And after that, we get our third and final movie of year five, which is a Batgirl movie. Now, we haven't established Barbara Gordon in any of these movies, but this is the thing. She could appear in Batman and Robin, maybe, but or it could just be she is a separate entity that takes on the Batgirl identity in this movie, and she is suddenly connected in her own world to the larger story of Gotham, setting up new characters, and she's doing her own thing. Maybe, maybe we see Dick Grayson goes off to college and his roommates, somebody that knows Barbara, and that's their connection, and she puts together that he looks like Robin, just something like that, that type of connection. That, that could be really fun, really engaging, something for these characters to do. And to round out our year five, I have the first season of a television arc, which will become very apparent in the next couple of years. We're doing Plastic Man. I know it's silly and stupid, but that's a character we have to play with. I want a Plastic Man TV show. Imagine the fun we could have with that. Very cool, very engaging. That is year five, Batman and Robin, Blue and Gold, Batgirl, and Plastic Man. When we jump to year six, I want to preface this by stating this is what my plan was from the beginning. I don't want to become the Avengers where every three years we have a big event we have to do. So here was my goal. Every six years, if this, if we're saying this universe is going to go for 20 to 25 years with these characters aging in and out of roles, every six years... I want to do a crisis. So what is my first crisis? We will get to that in a minute because before that, we have the release of another TV show, Strange Adventures. Adam Strange, a beautiful Golden Age character that can definitely hold his own in a cosmic Flash Gordon style TV show. Play against that if you wanted. A Green Lantern could appear in this. Maybe he goes on a mission and maybe he meets like Saint Walker or something like that. Maybe there's a war with Thanagar which we know if we all read Strange Adventures recently, which will lead into another TV show we'll talk about. But that is a TV show that is going to take us into year six, Strange Adventures. And from that, we jump to our first film of year six, which is the sequel to The Flash, which is also Crisis on Two Earths. Here's the thing I wanted to say. DC is known for its crises. I don't want to do a crisis movie within the first 
10 years. I want to introduce the concept of a crisis in the multiverse early on because that is something DC is known for. So in this Flash movie, the concept of the second Flash movie, the first movie is the rogues, the second movie is, oh shit, he meets Jay Garrick from another time. Now, at first we think, oh, this is the Jay Garrick from the past of the JSA movie we watched a couple years ago, but no, this is a Jay Garrick from Earth 2. And that leads us into what will become the crises later on. Now, I'm not going to be talking about another crisis in this series, but just know if we were going to years 12, I would do Infinite Crisis. And then if we were doing years 18, I would be doing Crisis on Infinite Earths. And then if we were doing year 24, I would be doing Final Crisis. And that would be the end of my DC year. If I if we were doing 24 years, and maybe I'll come back and do a sequel to this later. If we're doing 24 years, my entire universe ends in the year that we do Dark Crisis. Not, not, not Dark Crisis, Final Crisis, and that's the ending. But we're not doing that. First crisis we're getting to, the only one on this list is Year 6's Flash sequel, Flash of Two Earths. Then we're going to maybe tie into like some symbiotic relationship between Strange Adventures and Hawkman on television. We're going to do a Hawkman show and they're going to bounce off each other maybe. You know, Thanagar could become a place that he goes to. Maybe they're warring, you know? Could be fun. I don't know. I, I feel like you have to establish Hawkman, especially if you were doing the character in the JSA. That universe is something to explore. This could be Hawkman and Hawk Girl, which is the Hawk People story. Something to play with, which we will maybe get back to in a bit here. So year six, not a big year, but because we have a Flash movie that is technically a crisis, I wanted another movie that was going to be a big deal for people. So I want to do a proper, a proper Batman Superman World's Finest to round out year six. We have had two sequels to both of their franchises. This is the first time we're going to be seeing a Batman and a Superman on screen together who aren't feuding for some stupid reason. Let's have it be fun and powerful and cool. Classic Golden Age stuff. These two start to trust each other when Bruce is coming out of a strained relationship with his son. And Superman's coming out of a strained relationship with the world. These two learn to trust each other and build their relationship up for the better. Year six, a crisis, world's finest, and Thanagar and Zenla having some weird chemistry. You know, it's very fun. Very fun stuff. From there, we go to years seven and eight. And now, my friends, we are picking up a little steam, and maybe the picture isn't becoming clearer, but we're headed in a larger direction that should become vastly apparent to some people. Is it? I don't know. I don't know if there is a direction we're headed. So year seven, we have three movies and two TV shows. The first time we are doing five conceptual things in one year. And it's going to be both of these years because, again, both of these years, years seven and eight, are leading up to something bigger and better than we've ever seen before. That is what we're doing here. So starting off year seven, we have the sequel to Wonder Woman. It's been a long time coming. People have been clamoring for the sequel to Wonder Woman. Well, guess what? Now, my friends, we are exploring bigger and better worlds. We're going to more of like the Ares and Olympia stuff. We started off this kind of slow. Here's her pantheon now. We're introduced to Artemis and to Nubia and to Apollo. All these big characters coming back in a big way. Maybe it's going to be Steve Trevor lands on Themyscira this time. Either way, very fun. That is what we're doing for Wonder Woman 2. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be bolder. It's going to be badasser. And from there, we get another sequel this year. It's the year of the sequels in movies because Green Lantern 2 is going to be popping off and we're going to be introduced to the character of Kyle Rayner, our younger Green Lantern, because the world is starting to realize, oh, Something is important about Earth, and there, people are always drawn to it. He's our new hero. Very fun. Not much I need to say on that. You just gotta do it. Green Lantern could be our Guardians. I don't think it needs to be. From there, we're gonna get Catwoman on television. This one, you just have to do, because, come on, you'd have to introduce her eventually, and when you do, people are gonna be clamoring for the sexy son of a gun to show up somewhere, so that is where we're gonna put her. She's gonna have her own television show. Maybe it's gonna be separate from the, from everything going on in Batman, and she's gonna be just doing her own thing, something fun, something frisky, who knows? Something enjoyable. And around the same time, we release Catwoman. 
we're going to be releasing Mr. Terrific on television for one season, which will lead into something that we will talk about very soon because Mr. Terrific is a very cool character, very fun, definitely one you can explore opportunities and cool ideas with, a very cool character that kind of needs to have his own staple. Maybe you want to connect him to the JSA. You could if you wanted to. I don't think he needs to, but he's just like a guy that exists in his own bubble, is worth talking about and very fun to explore. And that leads us to the final movie of year seven, which of course is a sequel to The Justice Society. Now this one, maybe it's set in modern times and we're seeing the younger characters in the Justice Society start to pop up and become members of the team. It could be maybe Stargirl shows up. Maybe this is where we introduced Billy Batson. Just other characters that are maybe older, coming back together for one more mission to kind of like set the balance of the world in order. Just giving the younger heroes of the generation, by younger I don't even mean Stargirl, I mean like Superman, Batman... Wonder Woman, the Green Lanterns, the Flash to see like, hey, this is how they did it back in the day. Very cool. Hmm, I wonder if uh, seeing the JSA could inspire some of these other heroes to do something together. I, I wonder if maybe that would happen somewhere. Who's to say? Either way, we're going to end year seven with a JSA sequel, and that's going to lead us to year eight, where we get a Aquaman sequel. Just something fun to throw in there. Just to remind people that Aquaman's cool, his movie made a billion dollars, this character is worth talking about, we're going to invest in more Aquaman stuff, because it's a whole universe to explore, where are we going with it, who's to say, we're also going to have a very busy couple of years for the Batman actor, because we're going to be getting the third Batman movie, and the introduction of Jason Todd into the universe. We're done with Dick, he's off doing his own thing, which we will talk about later, and here we are now. Batman and Jason Todd together again for the first time. <laughs> together again for the first time. Now, I was thinking, do you just make this death of the family? Death in the family, is that what we want to do? Maybe. I don't think so. We could set up Jason a little bit more. Who's to say? From there, because Black Canary is the coolest character in the world, we're going to get the third season, which is going to exist right around our second, no, our third movie in year eight. So this one ties in directly to Green Arrow. Our third movie of this year is Green Arrow, and that and Black Canary Season 3 are going to play off each other, having the characters both appear in their seasons. It could be, if you wanted to, and this is what I would do because I'm a weird little boy that way, half of Black Canary Season 3 before Green Arrow, that happens the other half after. Could be really fun. Or I like the idea, hey, she's finally moving to the big leagues, and boom, what is the movie for Green Arrow? Well, he meets Dinah. They try to like have a little fun time together. Cupid's the villain. They get into a weird rom-com escapade adventure, and that's really fun. Also, in year eight, we see a big, like I, I guess, transaction? No, a big like change in television. We're, we're combining more stories together because season eight... No, year eight, I should say. I'm so tired by the time I recorded this. I'm sorry if I keep messing up. Year eight of this will give us the Terrifics, where we're going to bring Plastic Man and Mr. Terrific together with other characters from the Terrifics storyline. The idea is we have the fun guy, the smart guy, put them together, create a new team on television. Boom, there's a new legacy for us to explore. So year eight, we get Green Arrow and Black Canary meeting up. Plastic Man and Mr. Terrific meeting up, Batman and Jason Todd meeting up, and who knows, maybe Aquaman is going to have fun with his wife and have a child coming very soon. What a great year eight. Honestly, a lot of fun stuff going on there, because that sends us into our final two years, which are years nine and ten. This is where our plan ends, folks, because when we get to year nine, we open things up on a smaller scale than what we've normally seen, because we're headed back to Gotham City or some other city if we want to change it up somewhere for the question. 
Renee Montoya and Vic Sage coming together to do a question movie. I wanted to do this one since I started coming up with the idea. I knew the question had to be on here somewhere. Where to put that movie? Well, it might be a good palate cleanser type of movie, a dark noir story, because in year nine, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Hal Jordan slash John Stewart, Aquaman team up because there's a Martian from space who is crash landed on Earth and he's like, I need help. There's some weird shenanigans going on because there's this new supervillain team called the Legion of Doom that have invaded Mars, killed my people, and are working with the White Martians to start a plan to take over the world. And we need all the heroes to join together because it's Justice League. Year nine. Year nine. We've been 10 years into some of these characters' lives. Year nine. We're doing Justice League. Might be a little late, you know, even the Avengers teamed up in like year six, but I want this to matter. I want us to love these characters infinitely before we see them come together. They form into this movie and boom, the Justice League is formed. All seven original members of the Justice League are there. This is the introduction to Martian Manhunter. He will be the staple of the Justice League team. It all hinges on Martian Manhunter. Now, two movies, very different in in everything, The Question in Justice League. We have one more TV show coming out in year nine. That is an anthology show about whoever any creator wants to do a story on. This is essentially my what if. If somebody says, hey, I want to tell a Sergeant Rock story, I'm like, you go for it. You tell that Sergeant Rock story. If someone's like, hey, I want to do the Unknown Soldier or the Challengers of the Unknown, I'm like, you go ahead. You do that story. You want to do a mini series on the Huntress in like some parallel universe, you can go do it over here. You have the right to go do that. Blackhawks, you go ahead and make that over there. Jonah Hex, you do it if you want. Everyone gets the chance to do 50 minutes of your favorite character for whatever the hell you want. That's what this is. Hell, it could be anything. Another Hellblazer story, you go ahead and stick it in there. You want to do a Metamorpho story, you go ahead and stick it in there. Anybody can do anything here. Here's your anthology, 10 episodes, make your crazy shit. That's how we're going to end year nine with a bunch of random characters appearing that could just be interspersed everywhere. It's our what if, or it's our special presentation. There you go. The highs of Justice League are going to send us to here. It's whatever you want to make, you fucking make it. And that leads us to the final year, which is a big year because it's the first time in all of these years we have four movies to talk about. The first movie is, of course, Nightwing. We're letting Dick Grayson grow up and he's going to do a Nightwing movie. It makes sense. Again, year 10, we were introduced to Dick Grayson in year two. So eight years later, the character would grow up from being, let's say, a 10-year-old boy when we meet him to 18 years old. Now he's able to lead his own franchise. He's off in his own world doing something fun. That's what I want to see. That's what we're doing here. From there, we go over to Batgirl 2. Again, you could have both of these characters cross over in their own worlds, respectively, have something built that way. Who's to say? Anything is possible. Anything is fun. It all could work away. Maybe maybe Dick is dating uh, Corey at this time. Who's to say? And because we need a little bit of a palate cleanser, when we go to television, why not do something weird? Why not, why not really mess with people? It took, the, it took Marvel a long time to do Eternals. Let's do New Gods. Let's get another Jack Kirby thing on television. This huge, sprawling epic, the most expensive television show we're going to be making is New Gods. We're going to have Mr. Miracle and Big Barda and Light Ray and Orion and Granny Goodness and Dark Sod and Dark Side and Steppenwolf and everybody is going to be appearing in New Gods. It's going to be sick. Everyone's invited to New Gods. <laughs> Very fun. And that, that is... Not the introduction to Darkseid. Darkseid will be introduced at the end of Justice League, setting up the idea, the very notion that that character might matter when we get to year 24 and do Final Crisis. (laughs) 
So from New Gods, we are introduced to our first expansive character in the Superman world because we've had 10 years of Superman. Why not do Supergirl? Have him cameo to show his cousin a good time on Earth and have her story expand to something more sprawling and epic and creative and fun. That's what we're going to do with Supergirl. And to end year 10, right there around Christmas time, we're going to give you a really fun horror movie called Justice League Dark, which will reintroduce the world to Zatanna, who hasn't been absent, but she's been off doing her own thing for a little bit. And she will be leading Constantine and Detective Chimp and maybe Dead Man and Xanadu and all of your favorites from the Justice League Dark characters to do something fun. Great way to end the year and a fantastic way to end year 10 of our DC Cinematic Universe. A lot of stuff we're playing with, a lot of characters we're playing with, but again, I think it's all pretty fun. Leads to some really fun storytelling. And please, let me know what you think about all of this. Do you like my list? Did I go a little too hard not doing Justice League earlier on? Again, do you want Justice League to be the brand or do you want the character to be the brand? That was my thing. I feel like Avengers is the brand sometimes, and I'd rather like, hey, we're getting a really good Aquaman or Green Lantern story as opposed to having good Aquaman and Green Lantern moments in a Justice League movie. That's what I want. So that is where we are. That's what we're doing. Maybe year 11 is Justice League 2 and we introduce more characters. Maybe it's Blue and Gold 2. Maybe if you are all interested, we will come back and do years 11 to 24 and round out all of this stuff. Let me know though. If that's what you're interested in seeing. If not, that is my 10 years of DC. Thank you guys for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. As always, you can check me out on Instagram, TikTok, and Hive. And I will catch you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck.